who have our director Yuval and our producer Mark, and the story originated with Mark's journey um, with his faith. Go ahead, you're good to go. I, um, as a fan of music, I love the score. Did wow, you know? that's that's such a great compliment um, uh, because we treated the music as a character in the movie. Like the music was was really the narrator of the movie. So uh, wait, uh, Solly, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah. I love that you started with that. Um, the music is something we're very proud of and the vast majority of it was originally created by Ariel Blumenthal, who not only is a dear friend of mine, who I've worked with uh, in the film industry and even in the advocacy space often, he's a brilliantly talented musician and uh, especially with Mark's supervision, uh, he, he created this music for the film to tell the story. So I love it. Thank you for was, mentioning that. Was it created before the film or did it come as the film was progressing? So a little bit of both actually. Um, uh, we licensed some music from Philip Glass. And with that, about five pieces, we actually created some of the scenes around the music. Mm -hmm. With the music that Ariel Blumenthal composed, he did it only after pieces of the film were done. And he did the music to the film. Yes. Then at the very end, that, that is a choir uh, an acapella movement written by Tchaikovsky. And we had some, some guys help us find that. I knew what I wanted conceptually, but I couldn't find the piece I wanted. They found that for me. And the original recording we wanted could not be licensed to us because it was made by the Soviet Union and they refused to allow us to license it from them. So we eventually uh, licensed a different piece, which I never quite liked as much. And eventually we decided, what the hell, we're gonna do it our way. And so Ariel Blumenthal commissioned a choir in Israel to perform it exactly how we wanted. And he did it timed to the ending visuals of the actual art and stretched it out a little bit, moved some of the pieces around. And there were a lot of voices who, who were involved in, in putting that together. So. That's how some, sometimes it was done for the film and sometimes vice versa, depending on which kinds of pieces we were working with. We ended up with a total of 43 separate music cues in the film. That is perfect, it really is. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I actually have a conversation with uh, Ariel, the, the composer who created this original music for, for the film. Uh, speaking about how we release the music. So that's a conversation we still have to have and figure out. So Mark, I'll be talking to you about this after our interview here with Sully to, to know what our next step is with the music. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I geek out about audio, about sound. Uh, as a filmmaker and as a director, I always say ears don't blink. Right? Yeah, they don't. It's the sound that is something that whether even if our audience closes their eyes or whatever it is, they're still going to hear the sounds. So it's the music that was so important, but also these tiny little sounds that are happening during the scenes that I needed to make sure that I was capturing on set. Even the sound of, you know, somebody's hands rubbing together um, uh, or yes. clothes shifting. Yeah. Uh, any any little sound, it it allows the audience to enter the space in a very intimate way during the interviews when I was asking and allowing and then hoping that the interviewees would speak in a very honest, genuine, sincere, vulnerable way about themselves as human beings, not only about the greatness that they've achieved and, and the bold advocacy and activism that they have done as leaders, but I mean, gosh, if I could have captured their heartbeat sound, that's the kind of director I am. I want to hear every little yeah. sound. And, Me too. Right? Because it puts you in the space. 
it, it takes it away from it being on a screen to you're all of a sudden being there with them. And even on set, we have moments where we see the model's feet rub up against each other as they're stepping up on, on the prop, on, on the cross. And hearing that sound and seeing that intimacy really lets everybody take a breath because the rest of the film is filled with facts and information and the church did this and the church did that and the LGBTQ community did, did this and the LGBTQ leaders did that. And it's all of this noise and hap things that are happening filtered or, or, or uh, uh, counterbalanced by gentle little quiet intimacy. Yeah. And I love how like, it built up like the emotion of it. The, yeah. the emotional build is... Uh, that, that was a lot of work where I, I'm glad you recognize it because that was very much the aim. And that was a combination of three pieces of music. One is Ariel uh, put together uh, a Philip Glass piece of music that I must have listened to a thousand times. Uh, and then that ending choir piece. I am not a photographer, but I was impressed by the pictures. Wonderful. What what impressed you about them? Like, how did you react to them? I'm curious because you're we haven't had many audiences yet. We haven't even had our world premiere. So I want to hear everything that you thought. Right. Emotion wise, was that directed? Yes, absolutely. Like the pain. So you felt you felt pain as part of it. Yes, which is what we what you aim to do, right? I mean, the the pain that you point out was definitely something that we needed to convey because that's what that's what we were feeling, that's what the crew was feeling, that's what the cast mm -hmm. was feeling, but it's also something that you celebration. Yeah. It's also yeah. for the audience to feel. So you know, with art, it, the beautiful thing about art, whether it's, we're talking about images. It's all about rhetoric, right? Absolutely. It's not only about the creators of the art and what they're saying and what their thoughts were. It's about the audience because the art no longer is our own. It's now yours. It's now what you see in it. And it's like you now take ownership of it. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a frightening Moving intimidating, unnerving place to be as the artist, to know that I don't have control of it anymore. But that's also the beautiful and exciting thing about it. How long did the research take? The research? Well, that can be answered in different ways. Um, the research for this whole project started at the very birth of the idea of creating art that would represent my husband, Mark, uh, that because he was looking, yes, he was looking for something that represented him within oh, his own identity. And I, I said to Mark, I mean, I remember where we were as he was, as I was standing over his shoulders, he was sitting by his computer uh, at, at the home desk space. And I said, well, if you're not finding what you need, why don't we create it? Because you know what, you're not the only person who needs this. If you need this, there are other people who need it. And you know what? With all the activism and the advocacy that I do in my own life and that you, Mark, do in your own life, plus our work, we know that there are people who have a need for this type of art. So let's create it ourselves for you, my husband, and for anybody like you who has a need, and for the people who might not know that they have a need, whether they're LGBTQ or never met an LGBTQ person or have been shunned by somebody or have been othered by somebody or have been criticized, like let's create art for all of these people. And because this is so important, we have to document this project, this process. So why not create a documentary at the same time, uh, which ended up making this whole thing a much bigger project than we first imagined. So I'm, I'm kind of an armchair theologian. I've always got two or three books that I'm reading at the same time about theology. And I had a, some pretty good ideas of images I wanted, but we had to find them and show them to our team because they had to really translate an idea into a reality. 
And so there was a lot of work done researching different iconography. Um, another part of the research that I learned is pretty important for the, my first time involved in a film was archival footage. So we have a lot of uh, pictures and, and pieces of video clips in the film, right, to illustrate our point. And I didn't realize till very recently when we were answering some questions for the film festivals and uh, filling out forms, we have 390 pieces of archival footage in this film. Guess who researched that? you're looking at the two right here you know yeah. so when we had an idea for something to illustrate a point it was us that did it now sometimes on big productions they have archivists this is their job they go out there and do that but we had to do all of that ourselves and i'm the lawyer uh had to think about how you license this or make sure that you can utilize it all under under, under fair use principles so there was a, a ton of research on that score as well. And there was one section of this film where we had a very specific idea of what we wanted and we could not license it. It involved some candles. I think one of them, somebody was lighting one of them. Could not get what we wanted, couldn't license it. So Yuval said, let's go film it ourselves. We ran one mile down the road to a Catholic church and filmed my hand lighting a candle. <laughs> I don't know if we were allowed to film in the space, but I guess that's guerrilla filmmaking where you but kind we, of but we but we did it. So that was another gigantic category of research right there. And then the music itself was research. Uh, you know, I was given access to Philip Glass's library and I listened to hundreds of hours of his of his stuff and did, listened to hundreds of hours of other music to try to get the tone. And the idea that I wanted so that I could then share it with uh, our composer and say, you know, this is sort of like the idea. Um, but in any event, to answer your question, many different categories of very large amounts of research went into this. And to, to add to that, uh, uh, would you prefer Jesus or Salomon or Sali or which, what? I prefer Jesus, but I um, I put the, I was supposed to do the, um, I was supposed to do the interview on the Hollywood Times, but I went to my general and I said, hi, bye. All right. No, okay. So uh, uh, Jesus, when speaking about the, the research, um, I even had to go into the dark web, into the deep web to find some of this content, things that showed the abuses of LGBTQ people. There was stuff that I found, Mark, I mean, I'm sure you remember this, that I showed you things or I said, I'm not even going to show you what I found because we're, it's so dark and horrible that I cannot put it in the film. It will affect our ability to show it to audiences. It'll change the rating of the film. I mean, I found stuff of LGBTQ people being physically pulled out of churches and beaten up in horribly violent ways. So either I'd have to gray out or black out, you know, the censor it in some way, um, because it's it was important for us to know that we're also creating a film that can be absorbed and seen by the widest audiences possible, that it would be able to be seen not just at the film festivals, that hopefully a major platform will consider this film and put it on, recognizing how important this film is and the audiences that exist for it. And also that schools could show it, that that universities could show it. So with all the research, there was stuff that I, I, we, had, we couldn't use because how horrible it was. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that was a, the research was a huge, huge part of this. Plus with the art itself, I studied art history. It's I've, one of my degrees uh, or, or actually was a minor in art history. Uh, and I geek out about this stuff. And then Mark, my husband, who is Catholic, who was inspired the whole project, who was looking for specific iconography. Well, I got to utilize all of that in the collaboration with Mark, where we then created something that people could use, that people, that where people would feel seen. I mean, Jesus, we, we have, how do you create an LGBTQIA plus Jesus is it it can't be one person so we have 
a, a, a Latinx male. We have a Latinx female. We have a, a, a black trans Jesus. We have a black male Jesus, a Middle Eastern Jesus, a European Jesus, a Mediterranean Jesus. All of these, let's call them Jesi. I don't know what the plural is of Jesus is, um, right? To, yeah, I like it. to represent all of these people. So that's what happens because it now is more than just being an LGBTQ representation. It, it's a kind of a worldwide representation. I, I'm impacted strongly by this film. As a Christian man, I was impacted also by the sheer amount of mental health issues the LGBTQI face. Mm -hmm. In what ways do you think do you hope this film influences the Catholic Church? Well, the fact that you address how the mental health issues that are brought up in the film that happen very organically, it's important to look at the percentages of LGBTQ people who uh, suffer from anxiety, depression, stress, homelessness, mm -hmm. suicide, and loneliness oh. at percentages higher than their straight counterparts. That is a fact, and we had to put it in, and we did put it in the film. It's so terrible. It's terrible. It makes me sad. Makes me angry. So what do you want to do about the sadness and the anger? I wanted to turn it into celebration and happiness for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. We want to turn it into a happiness and celebration for everybody, uh, including you know, LGBTQ people who don't know that. Uh, I grew up in the, a rural part of the country in the 70s and the 80s. There, there was no vocabulary, uh, let alone experience of being gay or being lesbian, whatever the case may be. Um, and mental illness was a big part of not only you know, my life, but the life of, of a lot of people who can't even figure out who or what they are. I didn't come out of the closet to my family until I was 47. Um, and, and I had it easy, you know, really, I never got thrown out of my house. A lot of kids do, uh, a lot of kids, uh, turned to drugs. I never did. I was probably hardwired for that, but I didn't, but I think of all the, all of the kids who are living an excruciating existence because of who they are. And they, the only reason they live that is because of religion. That's where it starts. I mean, there are 300 pieces of anti-LGBTQ legislation pending in state legislatures right now. Who proposed it and why? Because of barbaric notions of religion, with all due respect. You know, yeah. and I want to try to be respectful here, but at a certain point, it's a little hard to. I mean, like we say in the film, the leadership of the, of the bishops in this country fought congressional legislation to fund a suicide hotline. And the only reason was because LGBTQ kids would have been able to use it too. I mean, it's almost beyond comprehension. Talk about a blind spot. And so, yes, I wanna use the frustration and anger here to bring change and joy to others. And the film tries to be joyful. Um, it is. If, if, if you see, if you look at, a thousand pictures or statues or paintings of Jesus, maybe one will show him smiling. We wanted to have Jesus smile in our pictures, a triumphant laugh, joyful. You just don't see it. Right. So, you know, not only did we want to have a black Jesus, a, 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 a Latino Jesus, a woman Jesus, uh, excuse me, we wanted to show Jesus in a way he's not normally ever shown. We get all the pain and the agony, but at the end of the day, we want joy and triumph. And that's, you know, how we wanted to try to ultimately, uh, that was the, the end, the note we wanted to end on. And you perfectly captured that, you know? Thank you. I'm not sure anything's perfect, but thank you for saying that. The, the next question is, even if Cadillac leadership 
believes homosexuality is a sin, it isn't. Why do you believe that they feel the need to ostracize people for being the way they are when in when nobody's perfect? It kind of reminds me of John 8, 1 through 11. Hmm. Why do they feel the need to ostracize others, making it clear that they believe that these others are imperfect? I don't think that that comes from a holy place or a right place. Mm -hmm. I think it comes from an unholy wrong place. Because if we truly are all made in God's image, if we are all holy, magical creatures, which is truly what I believe, I believe that humanity and nature and life is, is magic, right? That many people have tried to define through and with religion. That means everybody. That means all of us. That means you, Jesus, and Mark, and, and Annie, our fabulous publicist, and me, and, and ev everybody. So I think that some people, due to a lack of awareness, a lack of education, and a lack of understanding, have beliefs against other people. And this film aims to present people with their own genuine, sincere truth, showing them who they are, showing the audience who these people are for their thoughts and their emotions and just their pure existence. And say, just here, give us a moment or give us 95 minutes <laughs> for this film to see them, hear them, and see what, what, what this is really all about. Because I fear that too many of us who are othered, who are marginalized, are merely a concept in, our, in, in the minds of those who hate us. They can think about us and talk about us as a concept, but not as a human being who deserves equal respect. You know, uh, an another way I wanted to tackle your question, which is a good one. Why, why do religious leaders ostracize? It, it comes down to this human aspect. I don't know what the word to use. We are tribal. We just can't help ourselves. We got to create our tribe. Us, them. We're, we're like this. You're like that. It, it's been repeated a million times throughout the history of the human race, and it's just almost part of our DNA. But the, we have a conflicting part of our DNA. We want to be inclusive. We know this kind of thing is wrong. Um, almost every religion out there teaches radical acceptance, radical inclusion. And deep down, we all sort of want that. But then we can't get out of our own way. You know, if you, if you just sit down and spend any time at all with the Christian scriptures or the scriptures of almost every religion, you're going to see nothing but but behavior from um, Buddha, Jesus, uh, whoever, pick them, uh, of, of acceptance. Yet over time, over hundreds of years, thousands of years, all this, you know, sort of barnacles build up like on the underside of a ship. This this human structure, institution that just kind of seems to forget this basic human desire for community, even though we all engage in tribal behavior, which we know is wrong. So, you know, it's one of these things, it's a mystery to me, it's a frustrating mystery, but it, it comes down to that kind of basic human behavior. I agree. I mean, you know, uh, Jesus, in in the research that I did on you, right, to see who we were about to speak with, I was impressed when um, when you define yourself as a lover, a fighter, a disruptor, and a dreamer who never gives up on the things worth fighting for. That's how you describe yourself. And that's really what we needed to also, and that was part of our goal with this film, is to let people be all of those things, to be a lover, to be a fighter, to be a disruptor, to be a dreamer, and never give up on the things worth fighting for. I mean, I'm taking your words and repeating them back to you. Yeah. But that's when people feel that life is hard, because you know what? Life is hard for a lot of people. Life can be really challenging, um, and it is very challenging. And the more you're aware of life, the more challenging it is.
But if we can at least lean on the concept of community and of love and of resilience and perseverance, then, then we can continue and we can continue with more strength and hopefulness and optimism. And, and that is also a theme that's overreaching throughout this project. It's acceptance, it's inclusion, it's tolerance, but it's also playful artistry and playful exploration. Yeah. I like it. I love it. Because I used your words. I hope you like it. I loved it, actually. It's so good. It's so powerful and impactful. And I might not be the same, but I support it. Thank you. Now, what what do you think, how do you think people will react to this film? I mean, you're I, one of the few people who's seen it. What do you think people will? I'm hoping that they react to, like how I reacted, but a lot of people aren't as open-minded as I am. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this project can open people's minds? Hopefully, that's, that's what we need to be doing, right? So we need to aim as, as directors. Yeah, to open people's minds and to give, to give the story a chance, to give the concept and the theme a chance, which we tried to present both with the film and an art project and they're intertwined. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there will be people who will be very challenged by this even before they give this film a chance? Maybe, but to those people, ignore them. Just, you did your best, you know. You yeah. can't change any, you can't change like a lot of people's minds, but you gotta, you gotta just change who you can. That's right. So if, if that's my, my hope, and I'll, I can easily say our hope for this film, to change who we can, to let people be affected by the power of art. I mean, that's even our art. Our tagline to see the change through the power of art. Love that. Yeah. Well, you know, we have a journey ahead of us. We start with our first uh, festival premiere happening at the Out on Film Festival in Atlanta, Georgia, with the screening on September 24th, followed by September 29th at the Woodstock Film Festival. Um, so I guess Annie will. Before I spill the beans on other film fests, uh, I'm I'm probably going to keep my mouth tight until the festivals announce it. I have to take Annie's lead, but we will have another announcement today uh, from another film festival uh, that is going to happen in October, and then within the coming weeks, we have a couple other festivals that we will be announcing as well. Um, so we're very excited about that, and I feel that these these festivals are giving us a platform, are giving us a way to share our art. And it's more than just sharing of a film. It's mm -hmm. more than just a film being in a festival. It's sharing something that can be impactful and create change on social and political levels within churches, within communities, within congregations. Uh, this, is, this is a film that's also a form of advocacy and it's written throughout the film. I mean, it's clear throughout every part of the film. And the Powerful. Art. So it's, it's uh, we don't take it lightly. We, we, uh, we're highly appreciative of your time and your time interviewing us because your interview helps get this word out. And uh, I can give you all of the social media accounts for the film because as you know how big and important social media is these days. Yeah. Um, the film can be found, uh, and I'm sure Annie can share this with you as well, but at wonderfullymadefilm.com and on Instagram, wonderfullymademovie, on Twitter at wonderful underscore made, but I'm sure if you write wonderfully made, it'll come up as well. Uh, and on Facebook, it's the whole title, Wonderfully Made LGBTQ Religion. Um, yeah, we, I, I, I know that we need the support of audiences and press and people who just care, people who have a positive, optimistic view. We hired almost 160 people for this production, which is a huge amount of people, especially for a self-funded independent project. Um, it, 
it takes a village, it takes a community, and that now includes our audiences. Yes, I ran out of questions. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. I'm, um, I'm, I'm. We're truly just touched and honored, and you know, especially because you mentioned your own faith uh, and the things that you saw, and that's exactly that's exactly what we're hoping for is especially those who come from a specific faith tradition, that they will feel seen, that they will feel included, or that they will see the need for further inclusion and further representation. That's what art does. That's what film does and storytelling does. So I really appreciate you and your time. Thank you. I appreciate you guys' time too. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd be in addition to connecting, please connect with the film across social media, but also with Mark and myself. We're very easy to find on on the socials. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I, I think being connected to to others who share stories and share kindness is not only important; it's necessary. It's vital. It is. So thank you so much for your time. And, and if you have any other questions from us, uh, you can always reach out to us, reach out to Annie. We're all very reachable. And I, okay. I'm glad to speak to you again. So this is my first interview, how did I do? Congratu what? Congratulations, this, are you serious? I yes. Thought, oh, you've done a great job. I'm shocked that this is your first interview. Uh, your questions were smart. Your questions were pointed. Um, you allowed us and gave us the space to, to answer and speak about what really is a very vulnerable process. I mean, the artistic process is, it's a vulnerable space. And I think you, you the way you even went right into it by talking about the music, it allowed us to just enter the conversation in a very casual way, which I find important. So I, I appreciated that that was your approach and that's how you did. So yeah, this was great. I'm kind of proud of myself for doing it this way. Good. Good. Thank you Deep. so much, Sully. I, I didn't realize either, Valerie, uh... Your, your editor has done a lot of interviews with me. So I assumed you'd been doing it with her for a while. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, Sully. Thank, thank you. you too. All right, bye. bye.